Hello everybody and welcome to Charts with Dan. This is like an old school episode because we have so much to go over. Most of it doesn't even have to do with the movie that was number one at the box office this weekend. That's Mortal Kombat. It has to do with the movie that was number two, but a very, very close number two. That is Demon Slayer the movie. If you've been watching the show, we've been talking about Demon Slayer for quite some time as it was playing overseas, particularly as it became the number one movie of all time in Japan. It opened to stronger than expected box office here in North America this week, but actually the box office was stronger than expected everywhere because Mortal Kombat also exceeded expectations. If it hadn't, Demon Slayer would have been the number one movie this weekend. Let's jump right into it. Apologies if my voice is a little hoarse. Uh, I was doing the Oscar show last night after the Academy Awards. We have some Academy Awards data that came in, and it is not good for the Academy. We'll also be looking at that. But let's start with the weekend box office. And the number one movie, as I mentioned, Mortal Kombat, the newest version of Mortal Kombat, with $23.3 million. There was something of a box office anomaly that happened this weekend, which is that both Mortal Kombat and Demon Slayer had uh, more money come in than expected. So when we talk about the weekend estimates, which is what you usually see on Sunday, uh, they have the data from Friday and Saturday, and then they're going to estimate what the movie does on Sunday. Most of the time, a studio will overestimate just a a little bit what a movie is going to do on Sunday so that the number that most people read might be just a little bit higher than the final number. What happened yesterday is that the uh, both Mortal Kombat and Demon Slayer underestimated their Sundays, which means both movies performed better than the studios even thought, even optimistically when they reported the number. So these numbers are actually higher than what was initially reported yesterday, both movies crossing the $20 million mark, a very uh, tight race between these two. Uh, But that's not the whole story, the fact that Mortal Kombat was one and Demon Slayer was two. Uh, In its fourth week, Godzilla vs. Kong has faded to third place with $4.2 million. Nobody in week five is still in the top five with one point seven million dollars raya and the last dragon and week eight with 1.6 million dollars i guess the remarkable thing or the thing to talk about with godzilla versus kong is that it is rotating out of its hbo max window as mortal kombat rotates in so that will not be available on hbo max uh, in the very near future and uh the others you know they're hanging in there but but really let's talk about these two movies mortal kombat and demon slayer the movie um for demon slayer first and foremost it it, it did some when you think about the This is not just pandemic for the pandemic type stuff. We're talking about all-time records. We're talking about uh, movies that opened during the regular times. Demon Slayer made its mark in a few different ways. First of all, let's look at it as far as anime openings go here domestically. Demon Slayer, the movie, put up the second best number for any anime film opening uh, in North America, still behind Pokemon, the first movie, Mewtwo Strikes Back, which was huge back in the late 90s, as was Pokemon, so it's not surprising. Uh, just think about how much money that is in today's dollars. Uh, but Demon Slayer, the movie, there at number two with $21.1 million. Pokemon, the movie, 2000 in the third spot. That had, that was the number two movie. That's now number three. Uh, Dragon Ball Super Broly, which I think a lot of people uh, n- noted as, as a possible uh, for, foretelling that these uh, movies coming in from Japan with these very popular anime series uh, are getting more and more mainstream traction at the box office is at number four and then Yu-Gi-Oh! Uh, the movie Pyramid of Light also from that late 90s early 2000s surge uh, that we saw in the genre is there I should say in the medium not the genre is there at number five so Demon Slayer hits number two as far as anime openings but this is where it gets a little weird because it is actually the highest grossing foreign language film opening domestically uh, of all time. It beat out the previous film, Hero, which was $17.8 million uh, from China. Fearless, uh, starring Jet Li, was at number three now uh, from Hong Kong and China with $10.5 million. Uh, India's uh, Bahubali 2, The Conclusion, is at number four. And then from Mexico, Instruction is not included is now at number five. And I actually had to do some investigation with this, and there may even be some margin for error. But the question is, why is Demon Slayer at number one, the highest foreign language film opening, when we just saw that Pokemon, the movie, was the highest anime opening? And also, uh, why is not Dragon Dragon Ball Super Broly 
uh, on the top five list for foreign language films. And from what I can find, and I was trying to do as much research as I can, the reason why uh, Pokemon the movie and Dragon Ball Super Broly both don't technically count as a foreign language film, at least uh, domestically, is that they were released in dubbed versions. So they were not released here in North America theatrically in a foreign language technically they were dubbed into english uh, whereas there are there are subtitled versions of uh, demon slayer available uh, for people to go to see and that's why it counts now there ve- there ve- may very well have been uh, the same case i was trying to find out with dragon ball super it seems to me from the research i found that the version that was released here theatrically was dubbed uh, but this is a very weird line because these are you know these are movies that come from different countries but it, it doesn't quite count it's almost like the oscars like i don't get how the rules count but officially from all the sources that i could find Demon Slayer is now the number one opening weekend for a foreign language film uh, domestically of all time. So it's already making a box office traction here. And this actually is the return of a chart that people have been asking for, but we haven't had the data for it because we haven't really had movies in theaters. And even then, there's only been kind of one big movie at a time. But this is a great number. We're going to go to the top per theater average. It's an oldie but a goodie. And Demon Slayer the movie was the number one a highest grossing film per theater this past weekend. Now, if, if you if you haven't been with us before and, and we haven't done per theater in a while, that basically means per location. Not every movie come, comes out in the same location. So even though a movie may make substantially less, we see this with limited release movies, Oscar movies, they will often win the per theater average race because they'll only make $100,000, but they'll only be playing in three theaters, which means it's making $33,000 per theater. Demon Slayer easily won the per theater average for this past weekend, $13,171. It actually doubled almost what Mortal Kombat was making per theater. Uh, It was also in about half the number of theaters that Mortal Kombat was in. So the thing that that tells you is uh, that means that every, on average, every screening of Demon Slayer generated much more income, was probably more crowded than every screening of Mortal Kombat. And also, we, we, we talk about, now this is, a, this is a big wide release for an anime film. They've had progressively wider releases, but that also says that if it were released in perhaps a couple hundred more theaters, it's very possible that Demon Slayer could have beaten Mortal Kombat if you had just added more theaters because perhaps there would have been people uh, who were trying to get into screenings that were sold out or it wasn't playing near them. Um, You know, accessibility is hard anyway, particularly now when theaters aren't even open in every part of the country. Uh, But if Demon Slayer had come out in maybe two or 300 more theaters, I think we could be talking about a shocking narrow win for that movie to become the number one movie at the box office this weekend. It didn't quite get there, but a really impressive performance from Demon Slayer that outstripped all expectations. And there's something that's very sneaky that's been going on. You know, we, we talked at the end of last year, going into this year, 2021, how Demon Slayer was doing at the Japanese box office. It has since gone on to other markets and performed very, very well. It may soon add a huge title to, uh, to snap onto its belt there, along with all of the other firsts and number ones that it's achieved. Let's look at the 2020 worldwide box office. And over the past several months, Demon Slayer has been sneakily moving up the chart. Right now, this is where it gets a little tricky. Some sources have the 800 at about 10 million more dollars than it currently sits at about 472. Um, so Demon Slayer is not quite within the same striking distance, but it's not just expanding to the, the North American market. It's still expanding to a few other foreign markets. It seems very likely, and, and some of the sources that I've read say that depending on box office reporting, perhaps it has already happened that Demon Slayer the movie is going to be the highest grossing film at the 2020 worldwide box office. Now, this is a very special situation. Obviously, the season was curtailed curtailed for everybody worldwide, but this is a really, I mean, we're gonna have more than likely, I think it's almost a certainty at this point that there's going to be an anime movie from Japan. Animated film is going to be the number one film worldwide. It will go in the record books as 2020's top grossing film. Now, some people may say, well, that doesn't count because it made some of its money in 2021. Doesn't matter. If it was released in 2020, then that's where it goes on the worldwide chart in most cases. Sometimes there's a movie like The Gentleman, which kind of jumps back and forth. But technically speaking, 
This is a 2020 movie, so even though we're in going almost into May of 2021, this is probably going to put Demon Slayer over the top to become the number one film in the entire world in 2020. It also jumps onto the 2021 domestic chart, opening at number six, just behind Nobody. It's gonna, it's going to pass Nobody probably in the next uh, few days to become the fifth highest grossing film of the year. And depending on how Mortal Kombat holds up and, and how this movie holds up, we could see these two actually seeing which one is going to make more money. If there's a big drop off from Mortal Kombat, and if there are some people who were not able to get into screenings of Demon Slayer this past weekend, we could see Demon Slayer overtake that film. I'm not saying that's a certainty, but it's definitely a possibility. So we have two new entries into the 2021 domestic top 10, Godzilla vs. Kong, still number one, followed by Tom and Jerry and Raya and the Last Dragon. There you see Mortal Kombat opening at number four, followed by Nobody for now, Demon Slayer the movie at number six, The Marksman, The Little Things, Chaos Walking, and The Unholy rounding out the top 10. And our two new entries mean that The Courier and Judas and the Black Messiah are both dropped off of the list. Let's look at the 2021 worldwide chart. Now, you're not going to see Demon Slayer on here. As I mentioned, it's a 2020 film. You're also not going to see Mortal Kombat on here. It has not yet made enough worldwide to jump onto this chart. There's actually not a lot of movement. We have Sister from China jumping up into the top five, Endgame from China dropping down into the bottom six, then Raya and the Last Dragon jumping back up to number seven. As I mentioned, um, when we do the show, worldwide box office reporting is a little tough to come by, so it, it and Tom and Jerry may flip-flop places a couple more times depending on what figures are available as I'm prepping the show. Tom and Jerry at number eight. Booney Bears the Wildlife at number nine. New Gods, Ninja Reborn at number 10, although uh, that is a slot that Mortal Kombat is certainly gunning for to get there into the top 10. And before we move away from the current box office, let's also look at the top 10 for the last 365 days, the last calendar year here domestically. Godzilla vs. Kong, still number one, followed by Tenet, The Croods, A New Age, Wonder Woman 1984, and Tom and Jerry. Raya and the Last Dragon and the New Mutants stay there, but just behind New Mutants, and it will pass it very shortly, is Mortal Kombat 2021. Uh, nobody actually moves up one slot, but it's about to get bumped down by Demon Slayer the movie. And the two new entries drop out unhinged, which was the first wide release after theaters shut down uh, following uh, the closures for the pandemic, and The War with Grandpa, which is a movie that we talked about. And this, this kind of goes to show you the differences in box office reporting because we talked about The War with Grandpa for a few weeks on the show because at the time that it was released, its box office longevity was pretty impressive. But now that we are starting to approach normal again, it's been knocked off the chart by a, a new release in its first week. These are the changes that we're seeing at the domestic box office as people are going more and more. And I think the encouraging thing, if you own a theater, if you're a fan like me of the theatrical experience, is that since uh, vaccinations have started uh, in full uh, and since big movies have been coming out in theaters, people have consistently been showing up to them. There has not yet really been a disappointing opening since theaters have been opening you know, in full, since we've seen Los Angeles opening, since we've seen New York opening. Godzilla vs. Kong had a really impressive opening domestically. We now have two films that uh, outperformed what was expected of them domestically. The bad news is that we have about a month before we have any huge high profile new releases coming out because Memorial Day really is the next window that we have a big movie coming out. We've got Cruella, which is gonna be one of those hybrid movies. And then we also have A Quiet Place Part Two, which is uh, gonna be available exclusively in theaters uh, for 45 days. So that is gonna be a great test of people going to see films that you can only see in a theater. It'll be one of the first studio movies to come out that you could not simultaneously see uh, on a streaming service. I am looking forward to A Quiet Place Part 2. The only thing I'm disappointed at is that we're really gaining steam and we're really gaining momentum at the domestic box office, and now we're just going to hit this dead zone. I wish that there was one other movie maybe that had moved up to kind of fill this gap, but nobody knew what the marketplace was going to be like, whether movie going would even be an option at this point. It does seem like the studios that put their stake in and said that we are going to move our releases up uh, may be in line uh, for a pretty handsome financial reward because it does. the evidence does seem to indicate that audiences are ready to go to the movies, they have been anticipating it, and that they are going to show up to see these new films. Something that audiences did not show up to see 
were the Academy Awards, which were last night. I did a long uh, a recap show and review show last night here on the channel featuring my thoughts and then a bunch of questions from you at home. And I want to thank everybody that watched last night and sent in the Streamlabs and Super Chats and asked a question. Uh, it was a weird show, ultimately an anticlimactic show. I don't think that it was uh, a very smart producerial decision to structure the show the way that they did. But uh, separate and apart from that, this year's Academy Awards is also going to kind of go down in infamy as the lowest rated Academy Awards show ever, which to be fair, uh, I believe last year's was as well, but it's by a huge margin. This is a graph of the last 10 Academy Awards ceremonies going back to 2012, where it logged 39.4 million viewers. You see it had a couple of years of an uptick uh, in 2014. It had 43.7 million viewers. That was the year that they were giving awards to movies like Gravity and The Wolf of Wall Street, along with 12 Years a Slave. Uh, some box office hits sprinkled in there. Uh, you had a host in Ellen DeGeneres that people uh, enjoyed. You had some high-profile nominees. Uh, but then it started a slide. In 2015, it went down to 37.2 million, 2016, 34.3, 2017, 32.9, 2018, 26.5. That was the year of the smaller films like The Shape of Water uh, dominating a lot of the uh, award show buzz, etc. A, a little bit of a bump up in 2019 to 29.6. Last year, I believe, was the lowest rated ever with 23.8. But look at this dive. More than half of the audience dropped off between last year and this year's Oscars. The viewership declined to under 10 million. This is unheard of. This is unthinkable that the Academy Awards would ever drop below 10 million viewers. Part of it is that the big studio releases were all pushed out of 2020. There were smaller films. They were good films, uh, in my opinion, but they were all smaller films. Most people probably didn't see most of these movies. So I guess you could say that part of it was due to the drop off of interest. Uh, but I also think that just maybe people just weren't in the mood for an award show. It was definitely a weird award show. And, you know, when you look at the times that we live in, there's also been a marked decline from 2016 forward. I think perhaps uh, because the shows tend to sometimes uh, delve into politics a little bit. I think some people perhaps um, that's a turnoff for them and and they have literally turned off the television um even though the oscars have always been somewhat political if you go back to the 70s they were often extremely political and the ratings seem to to still uh, do pretty well there but there were also three networks what else are you going to watch uh, but we have seen a steady decline in academy awards ratings uh, but this is really a disastrously low number I, I think that a lot of people were perhaps preparing themselves for a worst case scenario with the ratings for the oscars uh, this is really just adding insult to injury because I think that they made a, a, a horrible decision in restructuring the awards to put Best Actor last, especially when they didn't even get the payoff that they were obviously building toward. Um, by the way, and I said this last night, if you haven't seen The Father... Uh, I, Anthony Hopkins is brilliant in that film, and it really was a shame that it came down to re those two performances. The other ones, by the way, also nominated were great, but that it came down to Chadwick Boseman and Anthony Hopkins because they were both brilliant performances, and somebody had to not win, and somebody was not going to get that award, and they were obviously making it. It was going to be Chadwick Boseman, but if you haven't seen The Father, I, I recommend it's, it's a very depressing movie, but Anthony Hopkins it's maybe his best performance. And I know that that's saying something. I think he was phenomenally great in that movie. And so if, you know, if you're wondering perhaps why he won, I would recommend if you have not seen The Father, watch The Father. And perhaps you could at least understand why it was a tough decision for the Academy. And I would imagine probably a very close vote. Uh, but the Oscars really have nowhere to go but up because if, 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 they're right, if the ratings slide from this, uh, they are going to be extinct pretty soon. My guess is we're going to see a big rebound next year because we're going to have more movies. It's going to be more of a quote-unquote normal year. You're going to have some bigger films that are nominated. It's going to feel more normal, um, perhaps be back in the Dolby Theater or at least you know feel a little bit more like an actual awards show. Uh, but yeah, just a, just a year to forget for the Academy Awards. 
Let's go back to a time when, uh, you know, there were some movies to forget here, but uh, it felt a little more normal. And we're going back to the brink of the summer movie season back in 1997. It's hard to believe, but this really is technically the start of the summer movie season. A year ago, uh, starting the first week in May, uh, was when Black Widow was supposed to come out. Here we are a year later. Black Widow has yet to come out, but we are on the precipice of blockbuster season. And back in 1997, there was a movie called Volcano, which sought to get a drop on the summer box office, which also started officially a little bit later, usually around Memorial Day than it does now. But Volcano in its first week opened to $14.5 million. Uh, I am a Dante's Peak guy. There's Volcano guys and there's Dante's Peak guys. Uh, I I am a Dante's Peak guy. I think that that is the better Volcano movie that came out that year. But uh, some people prefer Volcano and uh, Timon Lee Jones, etc. At number two, opening the same week, Romeo and Michelle's High School Reunion with Mira Sorvino and Lisa Kudrow. At number three in its third week was Anaconda with $7.3 million, almost challenging Romain Michel there for that uh, number two slot. Also right up there in the mix was Liar Liar in its sixth week, one of those Jim Carrey comedies that I love. It doesn't necessarily always come up first. People usually think of Ace Ventura and the Mask, but Liar Liar right there in that 90s heyday for Jim Carrey. I love that movie. And then The Saint and its fourth week, uh, Falling Fast, that was the movie nominally that Val Kilmer passed on uh, playing the role of Batman again. And even though The Saint didn't do well, I would still say he dodged a bullet by not being in Batman and Robin. Let's look at some other notable box office weekends from week 17. Believe it or not, that's where we are. Back in 1954, Akira Kurosawa's The Seventh Samurai, which is one of the most influential films ever made, opened in Japan. It wouldn't make its way over to the United States until a couple of years later. In 1995, Friday opened in second place on the way to $27 million. I think perhaps more people would think that Friday was a bigger box office hit, and for the budget that it was made on, $27 million is a great figure. Uh, But this is an example of a film that uh, was definitely a success when it was originally released, but has only grown in the now 25 plus years, hard to believe, since it was released. Back in 2011, so a decade ago, Fast Five revitalizes the Fast and Furious franchise. It had sort of been adrift with Tokyo Drift. Uh, And then the fourth film, uh, Fast and Furious, brought back everybody and kind of got the family back together, uh, more or less. And then Fast Five, though, really, you bring in The Rock. That was a shot in the arm. It's been 10 years since that film came out. And then two years ago, I couldn't believe this was two years ago. Two years ago on this very weekend, Avengers Endgame demolished just about every box office record that there was. Uh, It recently seeded its title as the highest grossing film of all time worldwide to Avatar, but it's one re-release away from maybe taking that throne back. So we might see these two trading that title off until maybe there's a new movie that comes up and becomes the highest grossing film of all time worldwide. Well, as always, before we leave, let's take a look at the streaming charts to see what people are choosing to watch at home. And we'll start with Amazon. At number one is the premium video on demand of Nobody, so it continues to make money both in theaters and at home. At number two, Tom and Jerry, which is now off HBO Max, still in theaters, but now available for premium video on demand. The Courier is there at number three. The Father at number four. I think we may see an uptick in interest uh, in The Father. I hope we do, at least, following Anthony Hopkins' surprise win at the Academy Awards. At number five, Promising Young Woman, which won a Best Original Screenplay last night. Uh, that is people are renting that still in the top five at number six chaos walking which was not and nor will be nominated for any academy awards is at number six uh riot and the last dragon uh, still available only for purchase at number seven uh minari comes back in the top 10 uh, perhaps some interest leading into the academy awards that film won best uh, supporting actress for yun yu jung last night a great speech at number nine the crude's a new age the rental and at number 10 news of the world which was not nominated for any huge awards at the Oscars, but also, you know, a new Tom Hanks movie. People are excited to see that film. That re enters the chart at number 10. Let's see what people are watching through iTunes. And at number one is A Promising Young Woman, which has been very popular for Apple users. Uh, that is at number one, Nobody at number two, Minari at three, The Cruisers at four, Nomadland, which has now entered a new window. It was available uh, in theaters for a while on Hulu. You can now purchase it. So the purchase of Nomadland is there at number five. That is, of course, the Best Picture winner. Also won Best Director for Chloe Zhao, the first woman of color to win Best Director. Only 
only the second woman ever to win Best Director, and Frances McDormand getting into rarefied air with her third Oscar for Best Actress, so a lot of notable wins for Nomadland. News of the World at number six. Crimson Tide, I love this movie, at number seven. I think perhaps because it was available to buy for $4.99. The Father at number eight, the premium video on demand. Wonder Woman 1984 at number nine. And then people are just digging on Denzel, which I'm all for it. Uh, anytime people want to dig on Denzel, I support it. Man on Fire also for sale to buy for $4.99, so that may be why it was in the top 10. Other than the fact that uh, that and Crimson Tide, just two solid action flicks uh, with Denzel Washington. Underrated action star, Denzel Washington, if you ask me. We always wrap up with what people are watching on Netflix, and we'll look first of all at the service as a whole. At number one is the Netflix series Shadow and Bone. At number two, Stowaway, a Netflix original movie. At number three, Life in Color, narrated by the delightful David Attenborough, uh, original Netflix series. At number four, The Baker and the Beauty, uh, not a Netflix series, but a series in its own rights. The Netflix series The Circle is at number five. Coco Melon, still sitting in the top ten at number six. Synchronic at number seven. The Netflix original movie Thunder Force at number eight. Nikki, Ricky, Dicky, and Dawn, the Nickelodeon series, is at number nine. And the Netflix original series The Serpent is at number 10. And finally, let's look at what people are watching just on the movie chart over on Netflix. The only holdovers from the, it was a big series heavy week. So the only holdovers uh, from that chart on this one are Stowaway, which is the most watched Netflix movie right now. It is an original film. Synchronic at number two, Thunder Force at number three. Then at number four, we have Edward James Olmos and American Me. This was a huge uh, uh, movie for him. Uh, the Little Rascals at number five, The Zookeeper's Wife at number six, The Secret Life of Pets 2 at number seven. Barbie and Chelsea, The Lost Birthday at number eight. Why Did You Kill Me, a Netflix original at number nine. And at number 10, Rush. If you haven't seen Rush with uh, Chris Hemsworth and uh, Daniel Bruhl, that's a great race car movie directed by Ron Howard. Uh, underrated, underseen film. So if you're looking for a movie to watch, Netflix has Rush, at least here in the uh, United States. Check it out. And that pretty much wraps it up for this week's charts. Like I said, this kind of felt like an old school episode. We're going per theater. We're going to history. We're looking at line graphs, etc. cetera. Uh, I'll figure out something to do for the next month and we'll have more movies to talk about. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, please don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you like what you see here. Hit the bell to be notified of uh, videos when I come out. You can be notified about some of my videos or all of my videos. I'd love it if you could be notified for all of them, but the, the choice is yours. Also, don't forget that this week is the beginning of my live show, which will become a weekly fixture here on the channel. Our inaugural episode is launching on Thursday at 4 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. I've heard some people saying that going forward that Thursday nights at 7, you know, in the future, there's a lot of people that are at first screenings of movies. This isn't a set time. If we decide maybe going forward that we're going to try a different time, it's just very difficult to, to navigate. There's so many established people out there that are doing shows. I don't want to step on their toes, and I don't want to certainly, you know, kind of get buried by these people that have already been established. So, this is where we're going to start the show, but we may uh, move on to a different time from there. But I would love for you to come and watch the show. We'll be covering news. We'll be taking your questions. Also, I would like to thank my patrons, and you can find me on Patreon at patreon.com slash Dan Merle. These are some of my producer-level patrons, and I am so thankful for their support. This is the top tier on Patreon, but there's a lot of stuff on Patreon as well. If you're at any tier, you get access to my monthly AMA. You also get a movie commentary every month, a schmodown recap of every match that I do uh, once it becomes public. The director tier also gets Dan's Movie Club at each and every week, and a schmodown commentary track from one of my older matches where I go back, I play along, and then the producer tier, uh, you you also join me every month for a Schmodown study session, as well as other perks. If you want to check out what's going over on on Patreon, uh, I would love for you to do so. Uh, it starts at $5 and goes up from there. But we have a lot of fun, and if you want to enhance what you're doing here, uh, please check me out there. But most of all, thank you for watching this show. I appreciate it each and every week, all of you that tune in. We are churning towards 100,000 subscribers, and as I've mentioned before, there's a special treat. I have an embarrassing high school video, my very first movie reviews that are actually on tape that will be shown on this channel when I hit 100,000 subscribers. It's going to be hideously embarrassing, but it's going to be in celebration of a great moment for the channel. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Stay safe out there. Bye.